Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, March 27th, and this is the weekly market update. So just before we get started, a disclaimer, anything that you hear on this podcast or video is not investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money and it's your responsibility. Okay, in this week's reality check, interesting graph here and article, which I will put a link to in the show notes. One big thing, 77% of Americans are worried about inflation. And uh, I think this is interesting because especially the demographic breakdown, uh, if you look uh, the ages 18 to 24 and 25 to 34, which is the gen um, millennials and Gen Zs, which really haven't experienced uh, any kind of environment, economic environment where inflation was a problem, they seem to be the most concerned, very concerned. And uh, I find it interesting that uh, as you people get older, they seem to be less concerned. So maybe uh, they're just comparing it to the relative situation that they encountered in the um, late 70s, early 80s. I don't know. I really don't know the answer to it. But what I do find interesting is, is that and what's important here is that inflation obviously is a monetary phenomenon, in my opinion, in my view. But one of the things that you will note if you study inflation, if you read um, like Mises or read the history of different inflations, you will note that what happens to people is people's behaviors change. They, you know, not in a transitory type inflation where you just have like a one-off for like, you know, six months or a year, but if inflation becomes endemic, if it becomes the norm, people will start changing their behavior to adopt uh, uh, an inflationary mindset. And then it almost will become a self-fulfilling prophecy and begin feeding on itself. What do I mean? Well, if people realize that prices are going up, they will do things like ask for wage increases, they'll raise rents if, they have, if they're a landlord, they will try to buy things before they go up in price, um, all kinds of things. And these things have a tendency to exacerbate the situation. So I think it's interesting because what's one of the things we've been talking about is, will all this money printing, will all this largesse from the federal government that's just being created out of thin air will it at some point lead to higher prices uh, i believe it will uh these things happen with a lag you know i believe that we're in the midst or heading to into a crack up boom and these uh initially feel good at the start of an inflation uh, everybody feels happy stock prices are going up housing prices go up asset prices go up uh, but the prices of goods seem to lag. And so everybody feels good because they feel wealthier. They're getting wealthier. And uh, we see that in the markets. We see that with the various bubbles that we've seen in the various markets, uh, whether it's in crypto markets, whether it's in, uh, you know, whatever, uh, housing prices, just, you know, baseball cards, whatever you want to talk about. Um, we have these, you know, this liquidity is just pouring into these things. And we've talked about this before. So this is something to keep an eye on. I mean, we've talked about why in the past, during past um, money printing episodes, if you will, why that didn't manifest as price inflation. And that's because the money wasn't getting directly to the people. That's changed now with enhanced unemployment benefits, with these stimulus checks. And, you know, now we have this administration and even the previous administration, they were, you know, they enacted a huge tax cut right at the end of a, you know, economic boom. That's normally not good. It wasn't paid for. It was paid for by deficits, deficit spending. So, um, you know, the thing about this is, like I said, when these inflations get going, um, it feels good at first, but then subsequent to that, the price, the prices start rising on goods that people need to survive. And that's when the pain starts to be felt. So this is what we're starting to see, right? This is the purchasing managers index 
for input prices for various countries or economic zones. So uh, you see this dotted line, 50%. So a reading above 50 indicates prices are rising. So what's this? This is the purchasing managers index. These are surveys done for purchasing managers and they you know, ask them questions about the state of their business, you know, input prices, all these different, I don't know, I've never seen the questionnaire, but that's basically what it is. And what, look what you're seeing. I mean, you're seeing, you know, basically prices went down during the um, initial stages of the uh, lockdowns and COVID and all these things. And they were already in an economic malaise in the Eurozone in Germany, but look at, because of all the money printing, look what's happening. Look what people are reporting. Look, I mean, you're going up at a trajectory that's like, you know, some massive roller coaster at you know, Six Flags or something like before the big drop, the beast, you know. And this is not positive. Even Japan, that's been mired in, infl in deflation for decades, is showing increasing prices, rapidly increasing input prices. Do not be uh, fooled. These manufacturing input prices that they're paying uh, will be passed on to consumers. And this is what I'm talking about. See, uh, uh, these, maybe this is transitory. Maybe this is a, just be, and the Fed believes that. That's what they're saying. They're saying, and a lot of econo economists believe that, that, well, we've had this lockdowns and a lot of supply disruptions. And as we open things back up, uh, this will uh, take care of itself. It'll just dissipate as supply chains get squared away. I'm not so sure. Um, a lot of productive capacity has been shelved, has been destroyed. A lot of small businesses, a lot of service businesses. So we shall see uh, what happens. But this is exactly what we could have expected to start seeing. And these aren't just like, you know, um, five or 10% increases. These are, you know, almost a doubling of input prices. So, well, I shouldn't say that because I don't know exactly how this is scaled and how it's referenced. But this is certainly not positive. Let's put it that way. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, whenever I find these little bubblicious uh, type indicators, I like to put them out there because this is just, uh, this is just crazy. I mean, if, even if you look back, what is this? This is the median stock percent above its 52 week low on the over the counter market. So these aren't NYSE stocks, these are over the counter. Now there's a lot of legitimate companies that trade over the counter, right? But there's also a lot of uh, crappy companies and penny stocks that trade over the counter, a lot more speculative entities than maybe investment grade. So look at, look at how out of whack this is this year, um, you know, over 300% above their 52 week lows. I mean, look at even like 2008 during the housing bubble and even back 2000 during the tech bubble. I mean, we're blowing these out of the water. I mean, this is like, this is just one indicator, but it's just like, this is, this should shock people. And this is all because of printed money. This is all because people sitting home speculating. This is all because people have access to no commission trading and they're just out there, you know, throwing money around. And I found it interesting that I don't have the exact stats, but there was a survey done that what were people planning on spending their stimulus checks on? And many people were talking about putting it into the market. So this is just another indicator of how out of whack things are, how, um, how distorted things have become because of the intervention of the government and the, and the central bank into basically, I mean, this goes back to the whole government thing. People know what I think about things. I'm going to kind of open it up a little bit more. I'm not going to hold back as much anymore. What's the point? I mean, um, look what happened. We had this thing happen. I mean, I'm to the point now with the virus that cannot be named. I remember back watching the original videos coming from China. I don't know if you guys remember this. Do you remember people like walking down the street and just falling over, collapsing and, or, and then going into like uh, seizures and they were welding people in their houses and, People were flopping around on hospital uh, uh, beds and blood was spewing out like in a movie, like in some kind of movie that Hollywood made. And so I'm curious as to whether this was manufactured, not necessarily the virus, but the response from China to scare everybody else. Because 
you know, we live in such a, you know, CYA society in the West that the biggest thing that everybody wants to do is cover their butt, whether you're a corporation, you're some Mandarin in a corporation or some government official or politician, you don't want anything blamed on you. You don't want your position threatened. So what you're going to do is you're going to uh, cover your butt as best you can. And so the initial reaction was, man, this is really horrible. Uh, we had this uh, fake study, and that wasn't fake originally, but the guy put out the wrong information, saying up to 6% or 10% of the population of the UK was going to die. And, you know, the news media runs with this because they love this kind of stuff. It sells its, its eyeballs. And so the politicians looked at it and said, look, I'm not going to get blamed for this. Let's go full bore uh, into this and, you know, overreact because they didn't want, they didn't want it to happen on their watch. And then why didn't you do something? And then they're out of a job. Uh, I mean, is that sound cynical and crass, but that's reality. That's human nature. And then I think what happened was, you know, there's a certain amount of sociopathy, uh, sociopathic personalities, and they like telling other people to do, I mean, a guy like this Cuomo, he's a piece of work. I mean, he's a straight sociopath, uh, fondling women and all the other things, Mr. Lockdown, Mr. You know, he got, you know, he just loves sitting up there pontificating. And uh, that, that was the same with a lot, some of these other politicians. And then we find out that maybe it's not as bad as we originally thought once the data started coming in. And then, you know, what happens? Well, they're not going to say, well, you know what? Hey, the, the, the worst thing, the second worst thing a politician can do besides not uh, overreact and cover their butt is to admit they were wrong. They never admit they're wrong. They're like those late night preachers that are always preaching the second coming. And then they give an exact date, like Hal Lindsey was famous for this. He'd give an exact date. It wouldn't happen that he'd make him an excuse why it didn't happen. And he was still on there for decades and people were sending him money. So, you know, uh, never having to say you're wrong. So, you know, that's the phenomenon we're in. So we're in this thing now where, you know, we've really, the government has really mucked things up bad. And uh, now they're, compensating by trying to create all these programs to fix something that they created because of their overreaction and their failure to admit they were wrong and their failure to look at the facts. And so now we're, you know, we've, we've done all these things and look where we're at. Now we have the possibility, you know, I'm not sure if we're in a super cycle in commodities. I'm kind of shifting back to investments here now, guys, I, you know, how my mind works back and forth all the time. I'm not sure if we're in a super cycle. Maybe we're just on a sugar high. I mean, if you throw five, six trillion dollars at a twenty-three trillion dollar economy, yeah, you're going to get prices to move. You're going to get economic activity to move. But when it runs out, what happens? So, you know, I'm not convinced that we're necessarily in a decade-long super cycle. This may just be a, you know, like eat one of those pixie stick, giving a pixie stick full of sugar to a five-year-old kid, and he runs around and then he collapses on the couch asleep. So, um. This is, like I said, this is just getting back to this chart. This is just another manifestation of, of this. And this is not normal. This is not a normal, healthy economy. This is not a normal, healthy society. Um, it's just not, <clears throat> I mean, the United States is almost not investable in my, in my point of view. I mean, I've differentiated between speculations and investing, but, you know, I know we're getting off the track here a little bit and some people don't like that, but, you know, it's like, this is really warped what's going on. And I'm not sure how this is this, you know, every time that the government creates a problem, trying to solve a previous non problem, then it just starts building on itself. It's like the mirror, that's a reflection of itself. You know, and you just look into it, and you see yourself a 100 million times, you know, I mean, it's it, they, they create a problem. And I've, I've equated it before to like, getting steering on an icy road, you know, the initial skid starts, you start oversteering, you start overcompensating, the skid gets bigger, you start overcompensating more. And instead of just letting off the gas and straight in, in, in just, you know, letting things straighten out by itself, uh, they're gonna, do, they have to be seen to be doing something. And the biggest thing that they, like I said, the biggest uh, priority for every government official or corporate Mandarin or politician is to make sure that they keep their position. And so, I guess circling back, this is really ugly. This is not normal. This is not going to end well. This is not going to be able to continue. And uh, the question I have is, is that when all these people try to sell, there's not going to be any liquidity. And so you're going to end up with a huge, huge drawdown. You're going to, 
I mean, when the stock market finally breaks and we do eventually have a drawdown, uh, I don't know when that will be. I mean, maybe the stock market goes down 80 or 90%. I don't know. But this is, you know, the, the, the uh, reckoning for this kind of behavior is going to be extreme in my mind. So I had a reader write in and, you know, I try to answer questions. I try to respond to things that are relevant uh, when people write in. And he asked me, he says, what's your view on Canadian, the Supreme Court rules in favor of the national carbon tax? Well, I'm not, I don't really, I mean, I just have a superficial uh, understanding. I don't have a big understanding of the carbon tax in Canada. I get the point, what the point of it is. Uh, but let's just go over some of the uh, things in the article, and then I'll comment. Canada's national carbon tax will remain intact after the country's Supreme Court ruled in favor of its legality. Three provincial governments had pushed back on the plan, arguing Ottawa overstepped its role with the scheme. And I believe it was Ontario, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. So obviously, Ontario is the industrial heartland of Canada and then uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, which I believe was the other province that were in this lawsuit, um, obviously have large uh, oil and gas and mineral extraction industries, which are greatly affected. And so here's what the um, Chief Justice Richard Wagner of the Canadian Supreme Court said on behalf of the majority, climate change is real. It is caused by greenhouse gas emissions resulting from human activities, and it poses a grave threat to humanity's future. So that's why they upheld this law. And, uh, you know, the Supreme Court has, are, has decided this because the science is settled. And uh, so shortly after the ruling, Federal Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson released a statement hailing it as, quote, a win for the millions of Canadians who believe we must build a prosperous economy that fights climate change. Okay, so what do I think? I think that carbon taxes work. I mean, they will reduce energy usage, it's proven. Um, people will adapt to it. Um, a lot of the, what's what I find interesting, people will say, well, why are these like large corporations like oil companies and um, some of the larger, larger companies, mineral extraction companies, why are they for carbon taxes? Because they want certainty. If they're not gonna pay it, they're gonna pass it on to the consumer. That's what people don't understand. You know, I mean, they think that, uh, businesses just absorb these costs and it's no cost to them and it's it's all unicorns and ice cream cones it's not like that when costs go up they pass the cost on to you especially like in a utility industry that's a regulated utility at least here in the u.s any cost they incur goes into the rate base that's all and they get a return on their capital i mean you pay you want the stuff you pay and um you know i don't understand in a country like canada with the kind of extreme temperature changes in the seasons, why, you know, uh, I guess part of the scheme is that, and I don't understand it fully, I'm sure somebody will school me up on this in the comments, that a large majority of it is returned to people. But what's the point then? I don't get what the point of this is if you're sending, so all this money goes to Ottawa or to the provincial government, they cream off administrative fee for all the bureaucrats that they has, has to maintain to administer these programs. And then people that are like poor or challenged with paying for their energy costs, get a rebate check. I guess I don't understand how it works. So, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it does work. Uh, you will see, you know, less energy usage. So people will turn their thermostat up. I mean, I, we had the Texas, uh, thing down here where it got 18 degrees down here by where I live in South Texas near the Mexican border for a couple days. I mean, we have electric heat. We run it maybe one day, a one day a year, two days a year at night when it may get down in the thirties. Um, we ran it for a week straight here, but we still kept it low because especially after I read the article where people were getting gouged like 10 or 20 grand on their electric bill, uh, when they had real time, they knew they were getting emails from their provider that, provider was telling them to change electric providers because they weren't going to be around uh, after this. Uh, they couldn't buy the power. Luckily, I'm part of a co-op and we have our own, we have all of our demand is already pre-bought from another co-op that operates down here that has generation facilities. But nevertheless, I mean, 
I guess I really don't understand. And I, the other thing I don't understand is, you know, what is Canada doing? I mean, it's such a small country population wise. And we live on this globe. I mean, if as long as China and India and other developing countries are not on board with this CO2 reduction, it's not going to matter. All you're doing is making yourself less competitive. Okay. So you get in a situation where the manufacturing will leave. Okay. And then you're going to be in a situation. As, here we go again. The government causes this problem and thinking that they're doing something good or just being cynical because that's part of my belief and uh that they're just you know getting paid and they want political power but the manufacturing leaves and then to low cost places where they don't have high energy costs because of carbon taxes i.e china i.e uh, other uh developing countries vietnam and these other places so then what's canada going to do put big import taxes on the incoming goods because they don't meet the carbon standards that the rest of the world has uh, agreed to. So who ends up paying that? The Canadian government? Wealthy people? No, the consumer pays. And, you know, so this is the thing that people don't look at. They think everything's just unicorns and ice cream. You know, I was talking to Trader Ferg yesterday. <clears throat> he, interv <clears throat> he interviewed me uh, for the Crux Club or whatever uh, they've got going. And we kind of talked about some of this thing, you know, this, the inability of people to, you know, you can stand outside of a grocery store and I guarantee you that a large majority of the people that I can poll when they come out and say, are you for clean air, and clean environment? Oh, absolutely. You know, who wouldn't be? I mean, to be against clean air and clean water would be, be against, you know, little kids, puppies and ice cream. I mean, no one's going to do that. But if you then couch the question as, well, do you want these things, but it's going to double or triple or whatever your electric bill, like in Germany, during the energy transition, they have the highest uh, electricity costs in Europe. Then people start thinking, wait a minute, there's a cost to me for this? Well, they're not interested in it then. Okay, so that's why, uh, you know, these governments have to force these things down people's throat because people don't want to pay for this. I mean, people are, people seem to act very rationally when they have to actually pay for the most part. So I don't know. I don't know about this whole thing. I know the corporations are for it because they like certainty and then they can plan their business properly. And then they know how much to raise prices or how to pass the costs on to uh, uh, the consumer. Now, small businesses can't do that. They have a hard time doing that. And, uh, but you know, big oil sands operators, they know oil's not going away. They're not stupid. People are not stupid that are running things. They, they know all this. And so they're going to raise taxes, just more control and more money, uh, for what it's not going to achieve anything. But I guess the point is, is it makes people feel good that are into this, uh, because they have a hole in their soul because we are creatures that desire to believe in something, whether that's religion or a cult or a political party or a cause we have that innate part of our being and it has to be filled by something and if you you know for people that believe nothing they will believe anything because they have to that's most people you have to believe in something and a lot of people don't have any kind of philosophical anchor they every most people are emotional beings and you know this is this gives them a spiritual it's spiritual junk food for them they they can fill up on it and it, it, it fills their soul, the hole that every human has in their soul. So uh, I understand that. I look at it and, you know, it's basically virtue signaling. It, they could, you know, uh, go to carbon neutral. I still don't know what that means. No one's defined that. I mean, we're carbon entities. You know, I was listening to Robert Friedland talk about this on uh, Macro Voices this week. You know, we zero carbon, we're carbon. Your pet dog's carbon. What are they talking about carbon? You're talking about carbon dioxide? That's different. 0 0.04 of the atmosphere. I mean, I wish people would define their freaking terms because it's so people are so sloppy in their discussions and in their thinking. It, cl it just clouds everything. And, uh, you know, zero carbon. What does that mean? The whole world is built, made out of carbon. What, what the heck are they talking about? Are you talking about carbon dioxide? I mean, talk. be, be specific. So that's... You know, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know enough about it, but this is the trend. You know, we're talking about, you know, I see Pete Buttigieg was talking about a mileage tax now. Of course, it'll be on top of the gasoline tax. 
I mean, because, you know, once your tax gets in there, it never goes away, right? They just keep adding the taxes. You have to register. We buy a car, you have to pay sales tax. You have to go reg pay registration plate fees every year. Uh, and some states like West Virginia have personal property taxes every year. You've got then uh, gasoline taxes to operate this thing. Now you're going to put on a mileage tax. I mean, it never ends, right? And, uh, you know, none of the problems are ever solved because we need more people in government and more money and we'll be able to solve it, but it never gets solved. Does anybody understand that? So rant over. Moving on. I guess the question was really that the guy asked me was, how is this going to affect our investments? Not, it's not. It's not. They'll pay the tax. They'll pay, pass it on to the consumer. You know, oil and gas are not going away. I, I hate to tell, and coal's not going away. I'm, I'm sorry to tell, I'm sorry to break, bust your bubble. It's not going away. Uh, the green revolution will be powered by diesel. I build renewable plants. We don't have like a portable solar plant that runs the crane that erects the turbines. It's diesel. Sorry, that's it. The trucks that go out there with the guys to maintain the gear, they run on gasoline and diesel. The, the trucks that bring all the materials to the site, it runs on diesel. The cement plant, port port portable plant that runs everything, it runs on diesel generators. I mean, guys, I'm sorry, but that's reality. So I don't, you know, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I thought this was interesting. Um, so NASA, before you jumped on my throat, this is NASA's data. You can quibble with the person that interprets it, but NASA has a, a vegetation index. They track this. And actually, vegetation on Earth has been increasing. And I'll cite the articles. You can go look at them yourself. Some people are going to quibble with this. But in fact, the CO, uh, CO2 has a high co correlation because it's plant fertilizer, basically, plant food. Uh, the globe has been green over the last 30 years. And uh, as a matter of fact, the Sahara Desert is shrinking. Now, I'm not tripping this all to CO2. I don't think anybody's making that claim, but that is a net benefit. So when we just look at all the negatives or we, or we literally extrapolate, you know, that the earth's just going to get hotter and burn up, um, these are things that have to be looked at. And uh, the earth has had substantially higher CO2 levels in its past, I mean, 10 times more than what it is now, and it didn't burn up. So, you know, I look at this as it goes back to something that James Dellenpole wrote a book about. It was called um, Watermelons, Green on the Outside, Red on the Inside. And basically the thesis of the book was, and it's my view too, look, communism and socialism never really got caught on in the West, right? Because, uh, and we saw that they failed. Uh, basically the Soviet Union collapsed, all the former Soviet republics are now having market economies. China, you know, with the advent of um, Deng, Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping, you know, it's glorious to get rich, all that. Uh, it's one of the most uh, market economies in the world now. And there's no really appetite for any of these ridiculous uh, schemes. And so what these people did, these bed bugs that want to control everybody, they shifted their focus away from communism and socialism to environmentalism. And that's where they've focused and built up over the last few decades to uh, take over and gain power and unearned wealth. So that's, you know, that's really where I believe a lot of this comes from. And uh, it makes sense to me. I mean, if we're all we're going to do is talk about CO2, which is 0 0.04 of the atmosphere. I know all, everybody's got all the studies, but nothing else affects it. Nothing like, you know, the oceans, different current cycles, the, the sun. I mean, the sun heats the earth. It has, it goes through cycles. It doesn't have any effect at all, seriously. I mean, so nothing else except for this one trace gas is the only lever that affects temperature on earth. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a guy, but it just doesn't make sense to, uh, take all those other components out of an equation and then just say, well, this is the main driver. Uh, not sure if that's really true. I mean, the fact is you can control that and tax it. You can't control the sun. You can't control the earth. You can't control the things that happen in the solar system that change things uh, on our planet. Um, so you can't control those. They can't be taxed. Therefore, you can't get unearned wealth and power. But if you can sell the story that a trace gas that is uh, part of the uh, 
expelling of industrial civilization, then that's something that can be controlled. And so if you create that narrative, now you can get unearned power and wealth. That's my view. I'll put the, uh, I'll put a link to this. It's very interesting. So here's something interesting. Again, we've pointed this out before, this happened before. Um, this is the uh, price of light crude oil. This is a index of oil stocks. You can see it's tremendously lagging. It used to be correlated up to about two, 2017. And then there was a divergence. Obviously, a lot of the oil stocks were not making money. And we've had, you know, all these different issues we've talked about before around oil. So I, I suspect that if we're in a um, oil bull market, which I believe we are uh, over time, I think as, uh, as long as this oil price will not bounce around, if it just stays steady or slightly increases and we don't get these big swings, I think what you'll see is the ability of the oil companies to generate tremendous cash flows, which will be recognized and you will see a closing of this gap. But this is a very large gap in the, um, in the, um, between the price of oil and the oil stocks. Now the argument can be made that we are in terminal decline for oil demand. So that's why nobody would own an oil stock. It's just like owning a tobacco stock, right? Uh, smoking's going down, not allowed to advertise. They paid tens of billions of dollars of settlements. Oops, but oh, by the way, they were the best performing stocks of the last century uh, on a dividend reinvested methodology. So um, I wouldn't, say that we're going to have the death of hydrocarbons this quickly. Uh, I may be wrong. Um, I may be uh, not getting it, but uh, just based on uh, my analysis, that's my feeling. So I think this is an opportunity. I think even for the like a larger companies, like I like a lot of the Canadian uh, companies, mid caps. I also like companies like Suncor and CNQ. I think they have uh, potential here, even with what's going on with the carbon taxes because you just can't get away from uh, petroleum, whether you want to or not. So that's, uh, that's it for this week, guys. Um, appreciate the uh, listening, um, appreciate the support. And uh, I just wanna do a one little session here. I have a lot of new subscribers. If any of you are listening, um, We've really had a big move in a lot of the companies that we cover in the Actionable Intelligent Alert newsletter. They are well extended because they've had a tremendous run over the last year. They've been the beneficiary of the recovery and the liquidity that we have seen be injected into these economies and these markets by central banks. They are kind of in pullback mode. Nothing goes completely straight up. I mean, perfect example is uranium stocks. They are down anywhere. I've seen some of them down 20, 25% over the last week. Does that mean the run is over? No, it means they get ahead of themselves. They get overextended. They pull back, they consolidate their gains, and then they move higher. We're in, but we're in a bull market for some of these stocks. So I wouldn't get too concerned. Uh, I would say just on the uranium front, there was another company this week, Boss Energy, which is based in Australia, did a share issuance I don't have the exact details, you can look it up, but it's just another example of a company doing a share ish issuance and buying physical uranium. So this seems to be the new fashionable trend among the uranium juniors. Uh, it will certainly help soak up the uh, so-called inventory. I've seen uh, tweets and information from reputable people saying that the amount of free trading uranium uh, in the spot market is not that high, maybe three or 4 million pounds. So we've seen the uranium price, spot price at least start ticking up. Uh, regardless, the, the supply demand fundamentals remain in place. Uh, obviously it would have been better to buy these stocks a year ago, but I think that if you are just entering the market now, uh, you will get a buying opportunity. Don't be too quick just to throw all your money in just because you heard a good story. Um, investigate, learn, and enter these markets in tranches. You can put, you know, if you have X amount of money, uh, divide it up into, you know, quarters or thirds or tenths, and just slowly over time enter these, enter into these positions. That way, you know, and take a look at the charts. If they're overextended above their 50 day and 200 day moving averages, they're way above those. Uh, that's usually an indication you, you probably they're overbought. 
I mean, I can't get into a full technical now. So that's how I use technical now to try to tie my entry points because things do get overbought. And, uh, you know, the worst experience of somebody can have is really be understanding something. They want to put their money to work. They start, you know, they're getting excited. They go and buy, they put their whole wad in. And then that particular uh, sec sector of the market goes into correction mode and drops 30% on them. And then they get disillusioned, sell out at the bottom, take the loss, and then, you know, are cussing the market. And then it, it runs away from them down the line because it was in a bull market. Like I said, these things don't go straight up. They, um, it seems obvious, but it's not for, for a lot of new, newer people that are entering this market. And you can't day trade these things. Get your positions on with the quality companies that you want to buy that you've researched or just buy. Like I've said before, for many people, most people probably, the best thing to do if you want to, as a generalist investor, is not try to go through and parse all 50 to 60 little dinky uranium companies, many of which are never, most of which are not going to produce any uranium. Your best bet's probably just buy the, one of the uranium um, ETFs like North Shore or um, that's probably the best one. And then, you know, you capture the general trend. You don't, you're not going to pick the company that goes up 10,000%, but you probably weren't going to do that on your own anyway. And, but you do capture a large majority of the move and uh, the trend. So that would be my advice. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.